Buenos días. Recordando a nuestros asistentes que a las 9 de la mañana comenzaremos la conferencia. Muchas gracias. Bom dia aos senhores e senhoras que estiverem conectados. Dentro de aproximadamente 15 minutos, estaremos dando início à nossa conferência hemisférica de Ciberdefensa, de Segurança e Defesa Cibernética 2022. Peço que aguardem na linha e dentro de 15 minutos estaremos iniciando. Um bom dia a todos e que tenhamos todos uma excelente jornada. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In a few minutes, about 15 minutes, we are going to begin our conference. I wish you all stay connected and we are going to have a great day today with our meeting and our conference. Buenos días, damas y caballeros que están conectados con nosotros en la conferencia hemisférica de Cyberdefensa. En 13 a 15 minutos, un par de minutos, estamos invitando a todos para que estén conectados que vamos a empezar nuestra conferencia hemisférica. Saludos a todos, gracias por estar brindando con sus presencias. Y en pocos minutos empezamos. of the uh, panelists, just raise your hand to let us know. Thank you. So 
we saw you. Thank you, Van Damme. We saw you.
Muy buenos días, soy el coronel Carlos Mayer de la Fuerza Aérea de Chile e integrante de la Junta Interamericana de Defensa. Te doy la más cordial bienvenida desde la ciudad de Washington DC en Estados Unidos de Norteamérica a esta versión año 2022 de la Conferencia Hemisférica de Ciberdefensa. Junto con agradecer vuestra participación y al igual que lo hiciera el día de ayer, quiero agradecer la tremenda confianza depositada en nosotros y también el orgullo que tenemos de decir que al momento tenemos 3.458 inscritos de 27 países provenientes de América, África y Europa. Así que nuevamente muchas gracias por la confianza depositada en nosotros. También aprovechar de agradecer todos los comentarios positivos que recibimos el día de ayer debido a la calidad de los expositores, a la claridad con que estos expusieron sus temas y además, por supuesto, la contingencia y relevancia de todos los temas presentados. Así que nuevamente muchas gracias y esperamos y les aseguramos en realidad que el día de hoy la conferencia estará al mismo nivel que el día de ayer. Así que muchas gracias. Bien, ahora para eh, comenzar y darles a ustedes la posibilidad de una mejor experiencia de esta eh, conferencia, de vuestra participación, quiero compartir algunos aspectos eh, administrativos. Específicamente este, esta conferencia está siendo transmitida a través de las plataformas WebEx y los canales de YouTube de la Junta Interamericana de Defensa, los cuales se pueden acceder a través de nuestra página web en www.hit.org. Esta conferencia está siendo eh, traducida de manera simultánea a los idiomas español, portugués e inglés. Les vamos a pedir, por favor, que sus micrófonos los mantengan apagados. Respecto de la formulación de preguntas, eh, esto se puede hacer a través de WebEx, a través de su modo de chat. Les pedimos eh, encarecidamente que eh, las preguntas eh, apunten a aspectos globales de las presentaciones, en general, más allá de algunas inquietudes personales. Eh, nos comprometemos a tratar de hacer eh, llegar todas las preguntas que no sean respondidas en, eh, en el foro a, a los expositores para que después se las podamos remitir a sus correos electrónicos, entendiendo que gracias a la alta participación, lamentablemente no vamos a poder darle respuesta a todas y cada una de ellas. Esta conferencia también está siendo grabada para su visualización on demand, cuando ustedes lo estén conveniente, posteriormente en nuestros canales de YouTube. Respecto a su rol, ustedes van a recibir en sus correos electrónicos al término de este seminario un certificado de participación. Junto con él van a recibir una encuesta de satisfacción y que le pedimos encarecidamente que por favor nos respondan para poder seguir mejorando estas instancias en futuros eventos. Finalmente, eh, respecto de la participación en el chat, también queremos pedirle que sea dentro de la cordialidad y parámetros que demanda una instancia académica como esta. Respecto al objetivo eh, autoimpuesto de esta conferencia, es el que se presenta en pantalla. Y básicamente tiene que ver con fortalecer nuestras capacidades. Por supuesto, potenciando aquellas instituciones que están en los niveles más críticos. Al mismo tiempo, buscamos instancias de diálogo de alto nivel para lograr este objetivo. La consecuencia lógica de esto esperamos sea una mayor cooperación entre nuestros países. En cuanto a la agenda para el día de hoy, es la que se muestra a continuación. Bien, queremos agradecer a la empresa IOSI Global por el desarrollo del sitio web y del video promocional de esta conferencia, así como a la compañía Cisco, por proporcionar la plataforma WebEx, por la cual la mayoría de ustedes se encuentran conectados. Bien, ahora dejo con ustedes al jefe de la Subsecretaría de Servicios de Asesoramiento de la Secretaría General de la Junta Interamericana de Defensa, con el de Ejército de Estados Unidos de Norteamérica, Matthew Hain, quien hará la inauguración oficial del evento en su segundo día. Mi coronel, por favor. Muchas gracias, mi coronel. Good morning and welcome to the Casa del Soldado. We're really excited to begin the second day of the 2022 Hemispheric Com Cyber Defense Conference. Uh, we had an excellent day yesterday. I'd like to thank everyone who participated and a special thanks to all of the team that, that were responsible for organizing this event. We have another great day planned for today. We want to get right to it. So without further ado, we'll begin our first panel. I'd like to introduce your first moderator, Colonel Alexander Ferreira from the Inter-American Defense College. Coronel, a palabra su. Um bom dia a todos e todos presentes. Com satisfação, retornamos ao segundo dia da nossa conferência. 
contamos com a presença de nossas ilustres autoridades, vice-almirante Rabelo, aqui conosco presencialmente, presidente do Conselho de Delegados da nossa Junta, e demais, em nome de qual autoridade, eu cumprimento todas as demais autoridades, civis e militares, que estão tanto presencialmente quanto virtualmente nos acompanhando. Eu vejo que agora, nesse momento, no nosso chat, já temos mais de 500 pessoas participando, já contabilizei aproximadamente muito mais de 10 países, é, parceiros que sempre estão conosco aqui contribuindo e enviando suas perguntas durante todas as apresentações. Nós agora iniciando a nossa jornada, que teremos dois blocos, com grupos de palestrantes no primeiro bloco e um grupo de palestrantes no segundo bloco, eu irei abrir um tempo para debates ao término de cada sequência de três palestras. Mas para nos brindar, no início dessa manhã, com sua apresentação sobre o tema Inteligência Cibernética Aplicada aos Conflitos na Zona Cinza, nós gostaríamos de apresentar o nosso palestrante Raul Pérez Rodrigues, diretor executivo da IOSI Global. O senhor Raul já está na linha conosco e passo neste momento para você a palavra a todos os nossos assistentes que estão ávidos pelo conhecimento que você tem para nos transmitir durante essa nossa conferência. Está com você agora a palavra. Muitíssimas graças por a apresentação e a introdução ao tema. En virtud de, del tiempo, que como en todo este tipo de actividades, siempre es un poco corto, vamos a dar inicio, si se quiere, de una vez con la presentación de la exposición. Voy a compartir mi presentación. Perfecto. Creo que se está viendo bien. Sí, perfecto. Oh, gracias. Ok, entonces vamos a, a empezar a hablar del tema. El tema que me corresponde a mí es el de la ciberinteligencia aplicada a los conflictos en la zona gris. Su contenido, voy a hablarles de manera concatenada sobre la guerra híbrida, lo que es la zona gris, el ciberespacio, la ciberinteligencia, la ciberdefensa, el ciberespacio como teatro de operaciones de los conflictos en la zona gris y el ciclo de ciberinteligencia que produce las recomendaciones y soporte a la toma de decisiones de los mandos de, ciberinteligencia, de, perdón, de ciberdefensa. Comenzando con, con la exposición de, 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 del día de hoy, voy a hablarles entonces que de la zona gris inicialmente. Ante, oh, perdón, perdón, antes de hablar de la zona gris, es importante hablar o tratar un término precedente dentro del ámbito de la conceptualización y doctrina referente a los conflictos bélicos del siglo XXI con sus particulares rasgos y características propias eh, de la era de la información y del conocimiento que estamos viviendo actualmente, así como del auge y desarrollo de las tecnologías, de la información y de las comunicaciones. Este término se refiere a la denominada guerra híbrida, inicialmente, la cual enfatiza que los conflictos actuales y futuros estarán caracterizados eh, por el empleo de estrategias asimétricas y no lineales, de naturaleza híbrida, en clara oposición a los conflictos y guerras convencionales, donde establece, se establece un orden y una línea, si se quiere. 
Sin embargo, el concepto de guerra híbrida abarca tantos aspectos tácticos y doctrinarios que ha ido perdiendo esa capacidad interpretativa y explicativa de los conflictos actuales. A estos aspectos tácticos y doctrinarios, la OTAN los define como amenazas híbridas, amenazas híbridas, que no es más que la combinación de, de medios militares con no militares, al igual que de medios abiertos con encubiertos, sumándole actividades de desinformación, ciberataque, inteligencia, ciberinteligencia, presión económica, así como el despliegue de grupos y de fuerzas irregulares. La combinación de tantos aspectos dificulta la interpretación y, si se quiere, la explicación de la guerra, en virtud de que muchas de estas acciones se desarrollan en tiempos de paz y no dentro del ámbito de una guerra declarada por lo que el término guerra no aplica en estos tiempos de paz. Allí se genera, si se quiere, un sesgo interpretativo que ha hecho necesario para los estudiosos de la materia buscar otro enfoque del conflicto. Y se dio paso entonces al concepto de conflictos en la zona gris. Entonces tenemos que esta zona gris viene a constituir el espacio intermedio ubicado entre las bandas, por establecer bandas, para, para la explicación, que caracterizan el conflicto político y separa a las formas convencionales de hacer la política, vamos a definirlo como la paz, zona blanca, de las formas armadas directas y continuadas de hacer política, o como bien dijo Clausewitz, la continuación de la política por otros medios, medios violentos, que lo vamos a definir acá o lo vamos a, sí, a definir como zona negra. El conflicto que se desarrolla en esa zona gris del medio de la blanca y la negra responde a un cierto grado de, de incompatibilidad de algunos de los contrincantes sobre la base de, del establecimiento de estrategias asimétricas e híbridas que implican una conducción de las operaciones en términos de logro de objetivos a largo plazo y gradualidad. En el mes de marzo del año dos, 2015, el general Joseph Bottle, en ese entonces eh, comandante del mando de operaciones especiales de los Estados Unidos de América, eh, fue interpelado eh, por, por el Congreso estadounidense, creo que el subcomité de capacidades emergentes, amenazas y se refirió en su interpelación a un entorno estratégico internacional en donde la globalización y la tecnología inciden de una manera significativa y elocuente en que toda clase de actores no estatales, esta, esta es clave acá no, actores no estatales se hagan con medios avanzados que solamente estaban anteriormente, estaban en manos de los estados. De acuerdo con las palabras del de, de recitado general, en ese entorno se, eh, es, va a estar, eh, se va a caracterizar por, eh, o el que tendrá éxito, será el que tenga la habilidad para conducir operaciones en conflictos ubicado fuera de lo que conocemos como el constructo tradicional de la guerra, donde estos actores, estos oponentes, operan en una zona gris, donde buscan asegurar sus objetivos y a la vez minimizar el alcance y la escala del propio combate. Eh, esta zona gris supone el enfrentamiento con la ambigüedad propia de la naturaleza de estos conflictos, permitiendo a estados con un poder relativo de combate, si se quiere, bajo en relación con un oponente, tener capacidad de proyectarse geopolíticamente mucho más allá de los límites de su territorio y de sus áreas de influencia, realizando actividades que pueden estar amparadas por la negación plausible y siempre con el cuidado de no afectar los intereses vitales de su oponente, 
o de su adversario para no recibir una respuesta, si se quiere, efectiva, porque como no constituye un caso belli, se, puede, se conduce bajo el límite inferior del conflicto. Ah, bien, entonces, muchas de estas tácticas y estrategias se desarrollan en el mundo físico, pero también son de asidua aplicación en el mundo virtual, que es a donde vamos. Debido a que a las características del ciberespacio, de ambiguo, la economía, la simetría, la ubicuidad y el anonimato, constituyen el teatro de operaciones perfecto, el teatro de operaciones gris y perfecto, para lanzar ofensivas orientadas a proyectar el poder y la influencia de manera asimétrica. Porque se dificulta de sobremanera la atribución de estas acciones con el consiguiente impedimento de la asignación de responsabilidades. Limita, esto limita cualquier acción de represalia y también incluso este, propicia un clima de duda razonable en torno a quien recibe el, el, el ataque, sobre todo en sus capacidades de defensa, de ciberdefensa y disuasorias. Acá pasamos entonces a lo que es el, el ámbito de la ciberinteligencia. La ciberinteligencia como producto del conocimiento, inteligencia, resultante sobre las amenazas basándose en evidencias concretas Incluye las capacidades, la infraestructura, las motivaciones, los objetivos y los recursos del atacante. Y como actividad orientada a detectar indicadores relacionados a ciberamenazas, extrae información referente a los métodos de ataque, a la identificación de las amenazas de seguridad, y, y tomar decisiones este, con antelación a fin de responder ante posibles ataques de manera precisa y contundente, participando activamente en las operaciones de ciberdefensa en el ciberespacio, tanto las de respuesta defensiva, las de vigilancia y reconocimiento y las ofensivas, siempre operando en la infraestructura y sistemas del adversario. Cuando operamos en nuestra infraestructura y en nuestros sistemas, estaríamos hablando ya de ciber contra inteligencia, que eso sería otro tema, si se quiere, de, de tratar. Perdón, no me fue la lámina. Este, cuando hablamos entonces del de ciberespacio como teatro de operaciones de la zona gris, generalmente el ciberespacio es empleado como teatro de operaciones en este, en este tipo de conflicto, de manera ofensiva y defensiva, siempre dependiendo del prisma desde el cual se mire, con el empleo y conducción de operaciones de ciberataques, ciberespionaje, ingeniería social, desinformación, correspondiendo a la ciberinteligencia, bajo la metodología del ciclo de ciberinteligencia, realizar a través del análisis técnico de los datos obtenidos y respondiendo a las preguntas qué y cómo orientar acerca de los mecanismos de mejora de la ciberdefensa y por medio del análisis táctico estratégico de los datos de, de esos datos obtenidos proporcionar al decisor un soporte sobre el cual apoyar sus decisiones siempre respondiendo al quién y por qué en definitiva o en conclusión la zona gris constituye una dinámica del conflicto político, donde no se está en paz, pero tampoco se está en guerra. Incluso se define desde la ambigüedad como, como si se tratase de una paz presidida por el conflicto. Las estrategias mm, sincronizadas y multidimensionales, multidimensionales que emplea encuentran un campo de batalla ideal para conducir sus operaciones en el ciberespacio, donde los estados beligerantes o grupos no estatales que participan generan acciones ofensivas y defensivas dentro del marco de la ciberdefensa, la cual respalda sus decisiones 
con el conocimiento, inteligencia, producido por la ciberinteligencia. Todos estos cambios profundos en la doctrina militar y de inteligencia, se podría hablar que sobre la base de estos cambios que se están presentando, producto, como ya he dicho, de la globalización y de las TICs, es, podemos hablar de una revolución, si se quiere, de los asuntos militares en la parte doctrinaria y sobre todo un tema que podríamos decir que está en pañales, que sería una revolución de los asuntos de inteligencia. Bueno, esta es mi breve exposición por razones de, de tiempo. Espero haberme ajustado al mismo. Gra Muchísimas gracias por su atención. Estimado Raúl Pérez, nos ha brindado con un excelente tema que es de la, de la inteligencia, ciberinteligencia. Y también nos abrió la, el tema de la contrainteligencia hecho por cyber. Entonces, creo que podemos en el futuro una otra charla para tenerlo, para hablar un poco con nosotros con ese tema, porque también es muy importante y actual, porque ayer vimos en la guerra de Ucrania y Rusia cómo este tema toca a, a los actores que están ahí. Bueno, yo he recibido por el tiempo... Creo que es interesante hacerlo. Yo he recibido preguntas en el chat y alguien que nos está acompañando también puede hacer las preguntas en el chat que estoy contestando y también buscando para pasar a los palestrantes. Y tengo una aquí especial hecha por el, nuestro vicealmirante Ravelo, presidente del Consejo de Delegados, que es la siguiente. El concepto de amenazas híbridas. ¿Es una evolución de concepto, del concepto de nuevas amenazas? Uh, estimado Raúl, está con usted la palabra para contestar la, la pregunta. Y las amenazas híbridas se podría decir, lo que pasa es que en esta doctrina, por llamarlo, no hay doctrina, si se quiere. Son opiniones y son conceptos de investigadores. Entonces hablamos muchas veces indistintamente de guerra híbrida de amenazas híbridas, yo traté de establecer la diferencia y la, como que dice el paso de guerra híbrida a amenazas híbridas, que son la base, si se quiere, de lo que sucede o lo que se manifiesta en los conflictos en la zona gris. Ahora, sí se puede decir que, que se viene de lo, de lo emergente. Son, son amenazas que siempre han existido. Lo que sucede es que gracias a las tecnologías de la información y a la globalización, que, que la estamos viviendo cada vez mayor, este, se, han, se han masificado o se han maximizado entonces estas amenazas que siempre han existido ahorita están en boga ahorita muchos actores no estatales sobre todo los no estatales los, por ejemplo estos movimientos estos, estos grupos estos grupos terroristas sobre todo que son esos actores no estatales que, estamos haciendo la guerra, que están, están haciendo la guerra a, lo, a, a los estados eh, las han maximizado porque asimétricamente están en desventaja, entonces, con, con un Estado. Entonces, ellos buscan las maneras de adaptarse, crear, superar y poder, entonces, hacer frente de alguna manera. Y entonces, por eso es que estas amenazas emergentes o paradigmas emergentes en cuanto a amenazas, puede ser que sí, sea un, es como una especie de, de, de avance en lo que sería amenazas híbridas, que son las que ocurren en la zona gris, no solo en el campo virtual, sino también en el campo, si se quiere, real. Y lo virtual no quiere decir que no tenga, lo, lo virtual sucede en el, en el área, en el campo virtual, pero las repercusiones son en el campo real. Entonces, sí se podría decir que, que, que es parte de esto, de esta, de esta evolución de los conceptos, hasta que haya una doctrina, si se quiere, definida al respecto. Eh, hablamos de, de guerras de cuarta generación, algunos hablan de que, que estamos, esto es todo esto de la guerra híbrida, de las amenazas híbridas, de los conflictos de cuarta generación, están dentro de la cuarta, de la cuarta generación, perdón, y eh, otros hablan de guerra de quinta generación ya, entonces bueno, lo cierto es que hay cambios en la manera de conducir la guerra, en la manera de, 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 de llevarla a cabo, estamos sorprendidos de la, de la guerra convencional tipo tercera generación que, que se está conduciendo en Ucrania, pero sin embargo con sus matices 
de guerra de cuarta generación y de conflicto de, en la zona gris. Bueno, muchas gracias, muchísimas gracias por su presentación muy clara, aunque sea curta, pero buenísima de, de oírlo, sus conocimientos. Uh, y ahora pasamos y también le invito para quedar con nosotros porque ten, tenemos los próximos temas que tenemos son muy interesantes. Empezaremos ahora hablando de Internet de las Cosas y voy a ahora cambiar un poquito para portugués para que nos acompañe y comprendan y después un poco de inglés para, para hablar con nuestra próxima palestrante que va a ser Verónica Reyes. Nós teremos agora a oportunidade de ouvir e iniciar o nosso primeiro bloco de apresentações com três apresentações de aproximadamente 25 minutos, ao término das quais eu irei abrir um tempo para os debates. Aqueles que tiverem perguntas podem colocar suas perguntas no chat ou nos apresentar presencialmente aqui para aqueles que estiverem presencialmente. E nós iremos agora ter o tema Internet das Coisas, Internet do Comportamento e as suas implicações para a segurança cibernética. A nossa palestrante que nos brinda é a senhora Verônica Reis, gerente de desenvolvimento de negócios da Cisco. Good morning, Verônica Reis. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today to explore a little bit more about uh, the environment for cyber defense. And what we are going to explore here today is initially bringing some concepts in how the IoT environment and OT environment are evolving and what we consider that. So to start with um, the presentation, let's take a look in what this means. So what is considered IoT? IoT, what we call Internet of Things. So it's a physical object, device, or group of such objects that contain sensors, softwares, processing abilities, or any other component that contain um, data and connect to the network. And it can also exchange this data with other devices and systems through the internet or in a, pr a private network. Okay, so every type of device that qualifies in one of the points will be classified as an IoT device. Okay, some examples of these uh, devices, we can include cameras, sensor, antennas, uh, vending machines, medical devices, and much more. We can go even beyond in a private um, uh, home environment. What we have nowadays, the appliances, smart, For example, uh, TVs, uh, Apple TV or any other video devices, streaming devices, um, fridge, uh, ovens, everything that use some intelligence connected through the cloud, internet or private network, okay? Going a little bit further, we have the operational technology, what we call OT. Uh, the same concept as IoT devices with the difference that this type of device, usually they use different protocols than IP as in the IoT world, okay? And some examples we have here, we have Emerson, Siemens, Schneider, Rockwell, and many others. Right. Uh, some example of OT devices, we have elevators, HVAC systems, lighting, uh, PLCs and any other type of industrial machines, uh, robots um, that does not uh, connect into the network using the IP protocol. Okay, they mostly use uh, uh, proprietary protocols. Okay, uh, going beyond, uh, we have what we call cyber physical system, CPS. What is that? It's a similar to the IoT devices. However, the CPS represent a higher combination and coordination between physical and computation elements, increasing the complexity. So what does that mean? 
We can use as example uh, an automatic uh, pilot system for an airplane. So the level of complexity and intelligence that is behind the scenes, um, it can be translated on the CPS system. Uh, the smart grid, what we have nowadays that it's all evolving, it can also be considered a CPS system. Okay, we have some other example, for example, aerospace or automotive process that also qualify for the level of complexity. So in a nutshell, everything that we are talking about here between IoT, OT and CPS, we are talking about the same type of devices, but with different level of complexities and protocols, okay? Uh, another thing here that it's important to explore today is the Internet of Behavior, okay, which is uh, the acronym is named as IOB. And uh, this is an area of research and development that uh, seeks to understand when and why the human uh, use technology to make purchase decision, website visiting, visitors, uh, and more. However, we have the other side of the same coin, which is also to use the same concept and we will see beyond, which is defining the machine's behavior as well, okay? And how this all interact with us and what are the concepts. Uh, in a nutshell, if we can explore the division between networks and the complexity here, and from now on, I'll try to focus the presentation in IT and OT devices. So when I refer to OT environment, you know now that I am talking about IoT, um, CPS, or OT devices, okay? So in the IT world, which is the one that we are using seeing, uh, in our corporate environments or government environment, you have the CIO and the IT architect as the main users and controllers of this network. And on the other side, when you talk about the OT network, it, this is oriented to the plant management, right? You have engineering uh, controlling the environment, and this is led mostly by the COO, okay? Uh, and why this matters? Uh, research tell us. Uh, nowadays, we know that this is a data from 2018. 68% uh, 60 of the security professionals say security is the biggest challenge to the IoT. Okay, once again, when you read IoT, that understand the OT environment too. Okay, so manufacturing has been targeted and complex environments are being targeted by uh, attackers. Okay. And we have some examples here to share, okay? Uh, ransomware is just one of the potential vulnerabilities on the systems. And we have seen attacks in very recent story uh, from Colonial Pipeline, CNN, JBS, companies that are being attacked and they are known for these attacks starting as um, OIoT uh, attack is a surface attack that it's using mostly uh, IoT devices, okay? So one of the, some of the concerns that we have for 2022 that has been in the executive's mind is first of all, the cloud-based uh, solution. Because we migrate more and more solutions into the cloud, we have seen that this connection between IT and IoT environment or OT environment implies an improvement of security footprint because the concern with the cloud now turns into a priority. And having visibility in what is being stored and circulating in the cloud, doesn't matter if it's a public cloud, public cloud or private cloud or a hybrid cloud, that it implies in risks, okay? A second factor here that we have to approach is the expansion of remote access. With the COVID-19 uh, situation, companies were pushed, and in one of the presentations that I attended yesterday, I could see exactly this point being explored, 
is that companies has to and institutions overall they have to expand to provide all employees better conditions and solutions to be flexible in their work environment and that translated to expand the risks right uh, and because of that Controls that were now just limited to the IT environment now has to be expanded to the OT networks too, okay? Uh, so in that sense, it's imperative to know what the agent or the user or even the machine is executing in the network, okay? So visibility is one of the components that we need to get. Uh, because of the devices and systems are more connected than ever, and we have seen in the course of this uh, uh, seminar, uh, adopting a zero trust uh, approach in the OT environment as well, it's imperative to control the device. And what is zero trust approach? Uh, that means that any device that connects into my network will be considered as a non-trusted device. It means that if I log in the network anywhere I go, I have to prove my credentials, my certificates, and guarantee that I have all compliance components to be connected in that network, okay? And one of the things that it's key here to, prove, to adopt a zero trust approach is having a segmented network. And that can be translated in isolating in controlling the assets access. That means if I am logging in the machine, in the system, and I don't have permissions to talk to any OT machines in the network. So if Veronica has a suspicious behavior, and now we understand the play of the IOB here. If Veronica has a suspicious behavior, we have easily controlled to isolate me from the rest of the network, okay? Uh, as part of this control, is also important to test all the applications and how we are having vulnerabilities as they evolve all the time. So not only it's important to isolate components of the network quickly and having visibility of what the assets is executing in the network, but also testing from a penetration perspective if I can break the, the network, okay? Um, another component that it's been concerned here in 2022 is encryption and that data loss prevention. And why is that important? Because uh, we retain more and more information and the devices, the type of devices, they also control. So when we talk about IT or OT devices, we need to keep in mind that many of those devices, they retain financial information, medical records, and so on, and sensitive information, like if we look at the government environment or defenses, uh, one device can retain many informations that are sensitive information, confidential information, top secret information. So all those type of devices, they have to be protected in order to avoid uh, disruption and loss of information. Okay, and finally, this is one of the concerns uh, that it, we have seen more and more companies adopting, which is using AI uh, similar to what we have seen in the IOB industry, uh, used to adapt and understand the malicious behavior and also monitor any suspicious traffic that we have in the network. Uh, threat intelligence also benefits the SOC team to predict what is being uh, um, happening in the network and easily isolate suspicious devices or behaviors in mitigation, okay? Uh, and one of the key here is to avoid disruption is being capable of detecting and preventing vulnerabilities, right? Uh, solutions without interconnections and without intelligence won't go further. 
I am sharing here just some of the examples of how an attack can start. So, and we know that they evolve every single day, right? And they can start with an email phishing. Um, an advert person can just open a, an email with a, an attachment and they can bring some Trojans or ransomware or malware into the network. OK, so in that specific point, it's important to have a solid social engineering assessment. OK, another source of the attacks and that is where related to the IOT and OT protection is software exploitations. Hackers has been evolved more and more and they go beyond in attacking those devices using vulnerabilities from the software embedded in these solutions to attack the environment and get space into the network. Okay, uh, finally, uh, we have password guessing and credential stuffing. And that is important to also look at the devices connected in the network and make sure they properly authenticate themselves in the network. So this is key to avoid that, okay? So in a nutshell, if we wanna keep um, our environment safer, we need to look at four pillars here. One is application and system security to make sure my security landscape is appropriate from the software perspective. Each the, uh, type of devices, IoT devices or OT devices, they have been evolved more and more uh, day by day, okay? The other component is, as we brought that up a little before, it's having the network and the infrastructure protected from a perspective of zero trust approach and segmentation, okay? And finally, it's important, and I have a slide uh, further to share that, that it's important having IoT security labs to test the vulnerability in these devices, and that is start, believe me, even from the ship. So from the ship to the cloud, we have to make sure everything is connected and everything is properly tested, okay? And that it just translates in simulation. Not only we need to understand and cover all those pillars, but we need to make sure because if we are prepared for an attack, because being attacked is just a question of time. It's just a question of when, but we need to make sure uh, we are prepared to mitigate those attacks. Okay, uh, so as I just mentioned before, if we look here at the bottom of this slide, at St. Jude cardiac device vulnerability, and this can be scary. In 17, the FDA announced that they found vulnerabilities in implantable cardiac devices manufactured by the St. Jude Medical. And that means that if someone decided for hacking your pacemaker, that can cause someone's death. So the complexity of what we have, it's way beyond of our eyes and limited to devices in the network. The complexity is everywhere. So to summarize, the focus and investments needed need to be in increasing visibility with solutions that, for example, full stack of observability that can cover the traffic in the cloud-based devices and any other solutions. So doesn't matter where this traffic starts or end, we need to make sure we are tracking everything that occurs in the network, okay? Assets control and solution for non-IT devices. And one of the questions that I saw coming up yesterday was about the cyber defense in the military industry because they have different protocols, different controls. Uh, and this is very accurate. We need to make sure those non-IT devices are protected and following all the standards in the network. Once again, adopting a zero trust approach. Segmentation is key here, but it's just one of the components. We have here other components such as multi-factor authentication, authorization, making sure the devices are up-to-dated in version, in software updates, 
to mitigate vulnerabilities, okay? And finally, having all the benefits of the threat intelligence implemented in your SOC or solutions to help you to get daily feeds in all new threats that we see in the industry. And finally, test. Test and simulating with uh, solutions such as penetration test or ethical hackers to provide you feedback in how far a hacker can go in your network or device to guarantee and comfort you in what is the level of security that we need to improve in each environment, okay? So that is the slides that I have for you today. I am open to questions right now. Uh, I think we have a few minutes spare here. So up to listen to you. Veronica, actually, you did a great job today. <laughs> yesterday, we finished, yes, we finished the day yesterday, uh, and we thought that we had a great time with our uh, conferences. And then when we began today, we give us some key concepts and you summarize with all the subjects of the importance and uh, the subject of Internet of Things. And you did a great job. And yeah. you summarize it uh, talking about uh, how the prevent and detecting these kind of things. It's a real thing that we live today and it's very important point and you give us give us a, a great pleasure to to know a little bit more we have some questions to you i will pass to to the next uh, uh, conference uh, person that we have and i ask you to stay a little bit with us to to answer those questions that we have right sure thing Sure. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you all today. Okay. When we were we were talking about your presentation, I was thinking about it and I will ask you uh, on the final of uh, this this block. Sure thing. Uh, okay. Now I want to invite uh, the next uh, that we have is Tisa Van Dam. I will talk a little bit in Portuguese to keep clear, and then Spanish, and then I will go to the English. Nós iremos agora ter a oportunidade de receber uma apresentação de aproximadamente 25 minutos também sobre o tema impactos da, inter... da inteligência artificial no conhecimento da defesa cibernética. A nossa palestrante é a senhora Tisa Van Dam, especialista em dados, e ela está já em contato conosco para nos passar a sua experiência, o seu conhecimento e a sua apresentação. Desde já agradecemos a participação de todos os que estão online. Nesse momento, nós temos mais de 700 conectados na nossa plataforma do Webex, e mais de 500 pessoas no nosso YouTube, a quem eu agradeço entre, em todos os seus países a, a presença nesse nosso, nessa nossa conferência. Uh, Ms. Tisa Van Damme, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and I will, I will invite you to begin your presentation with us in our conference. Thank you, sir, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to share my screen. Let's make sure that that is sharing. Okay, awesome. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, wonderful. So uh, my name is Tirza Van Dam. I am not a cybersecurity professional, so I'm probably one of the few in the room that's not, but I do dabble in um, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. So super happy to be here 
um, to talk to you all today. If uh, and I loved the last presentation as well. IoT is another has a very special place in my heart as well. Um, I love I love that topic as well. If you all have any questions as we go along, feel free to put them in the chat, and I'll answer them after after I finish. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. So. Um, Let's see. So I want to start with something that's kind of interactive, um, just a brief quiz for everyone. And uh, it's just a quick game. Don't try to overthink it. So my first question is, what number do you see on the screen? What number is that? Just keep that in the back of your mind. And then what bird um, what kind of, an sorry, not, I gave you the answer. What kind of animal is, <laughs> is this? And then last one is, would you clean your house with this? Okay, so I am sure you all passed the quiz. Um, and I know for a fact that your eyesight is not powered by machine learning. Um, and that is the correct answers are, you know, it's a, it's a number, it should be a number five is what you saw, a bird. And then the last one is just kind of for fun. That's a vacuum cleaner, a wave of a vacuum cleaner. However, in the machine learning model predicted the first, um, the first image as a number three, not a number five, um, as you can see in the green bar. And then it predicted the bird as an orangutan instead of a bird. Um, and that is because of small perturbations that were made in the pixels of the image that was fed into the, the machine learning algorithm. So this is just kind of a fun example to show how easy it is to trick, how easy it can be, I should say, to trick a machine learning um, model classifying images. So for those that aren't as familiar with the machine learning process, I'll just go over that quickly. Generally, you start with training data um, and that goes into algorithms that your data scientists make and it develops the model. And then once the model is deployed, you have a query that comes in from the outside. The green line is just kind of your outside boundary. And you have a query come in, let's say that image of a number five, it hits the model and then the model gives an output of response. And generally, you see um, the prediction score as well as a percentage of how accurate it thinks its prediction is. Um, now, when this gets interesting is when you have uh, the adversarial approach that is brought in. And this is when um, the adversary says, you know, wait, if I can control the query, if I can control what is going into the model, I don't have access to the model itself, but I, I can control what's going into the model. And then I can see what response comes out of that model. And then I can start to infer some things. I can start to infer how the model is interpreting the, the inputs that I put in, for example, the pictures that I put in. And this is what is generally called adversarial machine learning. Um, so uh, I will touch on what this is a little bit. Um, so adversarial machine learning is not recent. It's been around for, um, for a while, since 2014. But as you can see on this chart, it has been gaining popularity. Um, in most recent years, and research into this field is growing pretty quickly. Um, and the reason is because adversarial attacks are very hard to defend against, and they do pose a pretty great security risk. But you might be thinking, um, what is an adversarial attack? And that there, there are two types of adversarial attacks that can be classified as a white box or black box attack. Um, white box attacks are where the adversary has complete knowledge about the model being attacked. 
for example, for a machine learning model, like the weights, the biases, uh, the hyperparameters used, et cetera. And then black box attacks are where the adversary is really a normal user who only knows the output of the model. So it can look at the inputs that is that it can put in itself and then and then the output. So, you know, the model itself is the black box. And then adversarial examples are inputs to that model that are designed to make models predict erroneously. Um, and, and the most common research into this is in computer vision setting, uh, like we just saw with the pictures in the, in the quiz. And the significance of adversarial attacks um, is really because it's been shown that adversarial examples are transferable. So if you can make an adversarial example that works on one model, it and it, it essentially fools one model, it can also fool other models that have different architectures or different uh, training data. So it's pretty powerful in that regard. Um, and the, the mainstream kind of AI models that people are thinking about are that can be manipulated are facial recognition, self-driving cars, um, biometric recognition, et cetera. So um, that's that's kind of what acts that can happen. Um, and there are essentially five main classes of attacks. Um, that that industry kind of and academia recognizes today. Um, the first one is what we just kind of saw. It's called evasion. And that's one of those black box attacks where you don't have access to the model itself. Um, and, and in this case, the model is trained, but the <clears throat> attacker is able to change the input slightly. So um, in this example, you can see the, the picture um, unperturbed is identified as a panda with 57, 58% confidence. You perturb the pixelations just a little bit, and then it the, the model classifies the image as a gibbon or a great ape. So it's pretty powerful in how how little you need to change the input. Um, to trick most most algorithms or models. Um, and really, it's just, you know, another way to think about this is an evasion attack is just like an optical illusion for the machine. Um, a couple other examples on this is, you know, in, in, let's just say you have a stop sign and you put a sticker on that stop sign and an autonomous vehicle interprets that new stops that stop sign as a yield sign instead of a stop sign. You can imagine that can lead to some pretty harmful effects. Um, a little bit closer to home, if you use uh, artificial intelligence in your security cameras, a burglar could put on a dog costume and the system interprets, it, interprets that burglar as a dog instead of as a person breaking into your house. The next one is, um, is poisoning. And with poisoning, um, the adversary manipulates the training data set. Uh, they essentially intentionally bias the data set and then the machine learns the wrong way. A very prime example of poisoning is actually from Microsoft. So in 2016, Microsoft launched a chatbot on Twitter whose name was Tay Tweets, as you can, as you can see here on the slide. And Tay was designed to mimic the language patterns of a 19-year-old American girl and Tay was supposed to learn from interacting with human users of Twitter. However, this, um, this chatbot experiment went drastically wrong. Um, and within hours of interacting with Twitter users, it began responding with very racist and offensive language. Um, it was shut down just 16 hours after being launched and after it had given over 90,000 tweets. Um, and, and essentially what happened was um, users on Twitter saw Tay tweets and decided to start um, giving it really lewd responses and those received 
the investments that life and start to ignore it. Uh, in fact, providing training data that something happens at 3 a.m. every night and it's innocuous. So the system learns to ignore it. And um, then once that happens, that is their opportunity to attack. Again, in a military or defense scenario, you can imagine how this could be um, very detrimental. And, you know, if you have a, if you're looking for patterns of life in your, or if your machine learning algorithm, let's say from a camera, is picking up on everything that's going on, um, and it identifies certain patterns as, um, as patterns of life and not um, an anomalous event, it can be tricked into learning. Um, then, then you're ignoring that, right? And that is then an opportunity for the adversary to, to attack um, because that event isn't being picked up as something that, that should be looked at. So just a couple examples there. So that's poisoning. Uh, the next one is model inversion, and this is a little bit more sophisticated. This is a type of a white box attack, um, and so this is when really the adversary can obtain a copy of your AI system, um, and sometimes you can extract the model just by observing what inputs you give to the model and what outputs it provides. You essentially just poke the model and see the reaction. And if you are allowed to poke the model enough times, you can teach your own model to behave the same way. And that's essentially what this researcher did. Um, this is from uh, a paper that was published in 2019. And um, the private data the private training data was reconstructed using model inversion techniques. Um, so again, it's it's really the when the adversary aims at inferring the information about the target's model, and and then in this scenario specifically, um, they developed a solution and trained a second neural network that acts as the inverse of the target model to perform the inversion to build their own model. So pretty powerful, um, pretty powerful stuff there. Um, and then in a similar vein in the white box is really just model stealing or model replication. Um, and this can occur through traditional software exploits or repl again, replicating the model through careful cues. Um, and what's depicted here is um, open GPT, Two, which uh, is from OpenAI. This happened, I think, in 2019 um, by hackers. They essentially stole the model of OpenAI um, that created GPT-2. And this was not um, what anyone would consider to be an easy feat because it had one and a half billion parameters in the model. So um, it was successfully replicated and then and then OpenAI released it because it was replicated. Um, but an example of IP theft, if you will, in that. Um, the the another a couple other examples here for model replication in particular is, you know, let's say that uh, that you or your unit is using a commercial AI product. The adversary can also go buy a copy of that model by purchasing it or by using the service. Um, and then that gives them a platform to test their malware um, against against that those antivirus engines or whatever that commercial service is using. Um, and then back to this dog walking burglar example, you know, you could, the attacker or adversary could get a pair of binoculars and see what brand of security camera you are using, buy the same one, and then figure out how to bypass um, bypass the security pa parameters or the ML system in that, that's being used with that security camera. So just an example there. And then the fifth one is something that is probably not new to anyone in this room. And this is just your traditional uh, vulnerabilities in AI systems. So I won't stay on this one because this is just kind of more of your, um, more of your very standard um, vulnerabilities. So putting it all together, um, this is just a, a quick depiction of the five 
types of um, attacks that we just went over and where it fits in the machine learning um, system or, or process. Um, next, we are going to go through a quick um, case study. And this is, again, just to reiterate kind of how you can do both traditional uh, attacks um, and your uh, white box, black box um, adversarial attacks. So let's say that someone in one of your organizations, in your military organization, um, is a data scientist, right? And they post something on social media about a cool project they're working on. The adversary already has you as a target for your military organization. They see the post and then they spearfish the individual and obtain their credentials. And spear phishing, as you all probably know, is super easy to do these days. It's also fairly cheap and fairly effective. The return on investment for spear phishing is pretty high. Um, so going back to what many people have said, like just doing the basics can help this, this sort of thing. But let's just walk through this attack chain. Um, and given that the attacker has inside access um, via the valid account uh, from, from the successful spear phishing. So with this, um, as attackers on the inside, uh, we knew what we were looking for. Um, we, we have read on different um, public releases that there was a, that, that there's a resource provisioning service um, that used machine learning. We also know that the ML model or the machine learning model would have artifacts in training data. Um, so as a red team, we found that the credentials that we, that we obtained gave us access to two critical pieces of the model. The first one is just um, a lot of data um, which turned out to be the training data. And then the second one is some code, not the entire code, but some training code. Um, that So really this is just an example of overprivileged data and code storage um, that, that we found. And this alone um, provided us enough information to create our own model, um, our own local model, even before the API access um, before we discovered the API access. And this is, if you can do this, right, this is much easier and more reliable than trying to do a black box model where you would steal the algorithm, um, trying to infer it, right, or trying to infer what happens in, in building it this way. This, you're getting the data itself, right? So we built a poor man replica, right? It's not identical to the production model, but it did allow us to build a straw man and formulate a test, formulate and test an attack strategy um, offline. And the offline component is pretty important here because it doesn't trigger any monitoring or auditing. So, um, so by collecting or by conducting these offline attacks on the replica model, we created or we collected a number of evasive variants um, that would guarantee an oversubscribed prediction. Um, and we also discovered what services we could provision for um, virtual machines, the specs, the database types, et cetera, what we could do um, and what would be considered uh, a friendly or low resource container and that could be oversubscribed with high confidence. So with this, we requested, um, we requested a new account and, um, and then we used the inputs we discovered and deployed uh, what's called noisy neighbor resource payloads. And um, even though these inputs were built to evade our straw man offline model, they, they were effective against the production model as well. Again, going back to, this is a little bit different, but going back to the transferability of, um, of attacks on machine learning systems. And then with, with the resource requests um, and with high resource payloads, we essentially over provision and cause a denial of service to the other containers on a physical host. So this is um, just, just a pretty keen example on, on how this could work um, in a white box type 
type attack and using a combination of methods. Um, so with that, um, I know that makes everyone super excited. I know when I think of cyber, I always it's always doomsday. Um, <laughs> and in this case, it um, you know I'll, I'll go over some things that you can do here in a minute. And I know I'm short on time, but the bottom line is that this is very new. Most um, per Gartner and Microsoft's own research, there is. Nobody is ready for this. It scares executives. Um, the awareness is low. There's a low understanding in general of AI security um, leading to a very low posture. Um, I'm gonna skip over the next slide, um, but you know I do wanna hit on two things on this slide. And this is um, highlighted in red, there are, you know, industry and academia are investing in this. This is some of the work. Um, Counterfeit is a tool that I um, that that Microsoft developed. It's available on GitHub. It is a tool that you can deploy yourself against your own machine learning systems to identify vulnerabilities. Um, and then the second, if you want to research more, is called the MITRE Atlas. Highly recommend you look at that. It's um, case studies. Um, and and you can you can look. It's a knowledge base essentially of all these TTPs, adversarial TTPs, and case studies. So highly recommend you look at those. And with that, um, um, as already discussed, the other thing you can do is just red team your AI systems. And um, I I'll just leave this up as we close out for the references and tools, but thank you all very much. I'll respond to um, questions in the chat right after this. Thank you so much. We appreciate, uh, and you also did a great job, uh, Ms. Tisa. Uh, we have and received some question uh, that will be Mm, send for you and ask for you in the final after the next uh, presentation that we have. It's talk about steganography. I will talk about a little bit. And also, uh, in your first slide, we saw the number and uh, the bird and uh, tracking the shot. We have everybody say the number five, 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 but there's another guys and people there talk about number three number i don't know the number <laughs> it's a is actually it's a joke but uh, it's very interesting subject to talk about because when we try to compare the machine and the person that is using some uh, software we can see interesting things but now Para dar continuidade aos nossos trabalhos, nós iremos fechar esse primeiro bloco da manhã do dia de hoje, que está muito interessante, com a apresentação do professor Paulo Costa, PhD, diretor C4I e Cyber Center GMU. O tema apresentado pelo professor Paulo Costa tratará sobre segurança cibernética na cadeia de suprimento. O professor Paulo Costa já está em linha e eu gostaria de passar para aproveitar o nosso tempo também de debates logo após e na sequência da sua apresentação, passar a palavra para o senhor a partir de agora. Um bom dia e tenha um bom trabalho. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to initially um, make sure that everybody is hearing me, hopefully. Um, Yes, okay. So um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, in this very important uh, topic. I mean, discussing on, on this very important topic and um, to this uh, large audience that reaches most of our friendly countries in, in, in that also face these issues of uh, cybersecurity. So, uh, the topic that I want to talk today is uh, supply chains in cybersecurity. And um, I would like to start maybe with uh, attacking directly the target, the end target. We are taking many links. 
So we will have more opportunity to attacks and usually it will be easier an attack there than a direct attack to the uh, uh, end target. Another point is that the once the chain is compromised, you're passing the responsibility now to the end target. So uh, they will have to react. They will have to leave their uh, position of comfort to do something. And that by itself, it's uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, intentions in the attack. So supply so chain attacks are not new. I would say if you, I could come back to a millennia um, and, and find examples uh, from uh, Julius Caesar in, in Rome and, and even before that with the Egyptians. But um, so let me get to a recent one, and that's basically uh, Napoleon. So that that is in the uh, war of the first coalition. That's uh, 1800 exactly, and and basically uh, one one thing that I want to emphasize here is that Napoleon was in Geneva with an army, and they were in this campaign for the first coalition, and he was supposed to go north to go to Germany. And um, then crossed the Alps in less than a month. And that was by itself um, a major surprise. So when news arrived at the Austrian um, troops there, they were expecting Napoleon to go directly and attack them. And instead, what happens is Napoleon had information, he had intelligence about the supply chain for those uh, armies and they went to Milan where he basically broke. It was not only Milan, it was uh, the whole uh, south of the uh, Po River. And as a result, he basically cut the lines of communication in the supply chain. And he achieved the effect, which was they forced now the Austrian um, armies to leave and do something. And at the end, they went to the uh, Marengo, which was a place close to Alexandria, where they faced Napoleon's troops. And, and since they didn't have a plan, uh, they just had to react. Napoleon was able to defeat them, even though he was uh, outnumbered. So that was an example. And I think an impor important aspect to have this uh, in mind is that he did not attack the end target, which was the... Uh, uh, the armies in uh, sieging the city of Genoa. He went to the low hanging fruit in the supply chain uh, that they had. And by doing so, he forced them to react. Uh, so we're in a cyber conference. So why I'm going to a, a, uh, an example that is 200 years ago, um, just to compare, um, I would normally go through this uh, and present a number of uh, details, but since we had two very interesting topics, uh, presentations by uh, Ms. Verona Reis and Ms. Uh, Van, Van Damme, that they already explored some of the things I, would, I was going to say here. So I was just emphasize from this, that in the, um, this is an example that is very well studied. That was the uh, Russian attack uh, to Ukraine power grid. That was two days before Christmas, so it was meant to cause a lot of uh, uh, inconvenience and harm, and it succeeded. So same thing, instead of uh, attacking directly the power grid, they went to the supply chain on that power grid. So um, the, the, the little guy here, um, attacker, is actually um, not a good, not, not, not a good um, depiction because what you have is a large team of people. There is a uh, intelligence operation going on to learn about the uh, uh, directional transmission, all the, uh, all the things that compose the, um, so the, the power grid of Ukraine. There is a, a lot of botnets that were providing information on how the systems are, are linked. And, and so this, what I'm trying to say here, that that, that is not a simple attack. It was not a chain of events. It's actually a multidimensional chain. Uh, so the actual attack started with a compromised computer um, in which they just did an, a mail attack, something that a phishing attack that someone clicked in a link 
And by doing so, they gave the Russians uh, control of a, a, a number of uh, machines. And eventually, they were able to uh, command a power cut, so they caused an outage. And also, they, they compromised the SCADA system, uh, which means they were able to make the uh, Ukrainian uh, officials working on those systems blind. They couldn't see what was going on, and they caused a delay in the response. Uh, at the same time, they did a DDoS attack, that's a denial of service, um, in, in where they, as a result, they um, saturated the works, uh, workers that could be uh, addressing that situation. So for those of you who are in the military, that, that is the equivalent of the parallel attacks um, paradigm that, that came first to, to believe, I think it was in the first, um, in, in the first campaign of a desert storm. So they, they had these, uh, this is the equivalent in cyber. You, you're attacking many targets and together the effect is devastating. So uh, many residence areas in Kyiv were compromised and a large area of the whole country was compromised. So that, that was, at, in essence, a similar attack to what happens in the one that intelligence, where that supply chain is. So he could attack uh, Milan and, and figure out how to cut the supply chain. Same thing in the Ukrainian example. It, as you could see, there, there is a, a very large operation that took at least two years before the actual attack. And um, in, in both cases, they also forced the enemy to change planes, to leave their comfort zone and, and have to react in, a, in, a, um, in an unprepared fashion. So that was where the two attacks uh, basically uh, look similar. Where they are different um, is when you look at the cyber-specific characteristics. There are many of them. I'm just emphasizing two. The first one is it's not geographical. So as you could see in, in Napoleon's case, you could trace a line, you could see where the, the chain is and, and attack one of the links. And the links were like in sequence. If you broke one, if you break one, uh, it will be effective enough. While uh, in the Ukraine case, it was more of a parallel effect. You have to attack different things. So when uh, those attacks occur at the same time, you, you, you basically put down a whole power grid, not the whole, but a, a large portion of the, the, the power grid there. So um, it's not a chain really, and more of a network of chains in these mm -hmm. presentations. What happens is when you design software, you have the one is trying to attack you, it has a lot more of um, opportunities than if it was just constraint of attacking the end uh, system. So attacking the supply chain in this case um, it is where everybody's going, uh, the attackers. And once the chain is compromised, the end target is also at a loss. Uh, something has to be done. Status quo is not an option. So that's basically how it um, looks when you think on supply chain attacks from the cyber perspective. These are the differences. But the core idea is really the same. Uh, another example that I would like to emphasize here is, uh, is relates something that was also uh, mentioned in the two previous uh, talks, which is the ubiquity of uh, the supply chain nowadays, of the cyber physical systems that we have, and we take for granted. We don't think about it, but they are all around. And this example here is uh, an FDA warning that happened in 2019. So in 2019, FDA basically uh, warned people against the, uh, the 